had the enjoyment, really, of being with a couple of hundred of you a, a few short hours ago to really deepen a little bit more into the understanding and the experience, not only of trauma, but of its transformation. And the topic, I was really uh, very happily surprised when I read the theme of this is the mystery of being human. So I'm hoping that I can contribute in some way by exploring what I believe to be one of the roots of human, the human condition, which is the universal experience of trauma and its transformation, having the capacity to open many doors which are considered spiritual rather than psychological. So, let's go on here. Okay, so the presentation is from trauma to awakening and flow. And um, Carl Jung said that the separation of psychology from the premise of biology is purely artificial because the human psyche lives in an in indissoluble union with the body. And this is something that as a culture we have really lost really about what it means to be embodiment. I mean, that's probably not been in much of the history, the human history, maybe from the later Sumerian Egyptian period to the early Greek period, I think there was more of an embodied self, an embodied culture. And uh, this is a painting by René Magritte, the um, Belgium surrealist painting, which portrays really this disconnection from head to body. And one of the gifts of trauma transformed is that it takes us back not to the mechanical body, but to the living, sensing, knowing, prescient body. This, um, I don't know, maybe you have seen this, uh, it's, it's a tradition in Japan called wabasabi. I know it sounds a little bit like what you put on sushi at the Japanese restaurant, but it's actually a tradition where when a pot uh, breaks or a cup breaks, they, um, they fill the wound, the break, with gold. And what it does is it shows that when something has suffered damage and trauma, which you just saw a little bit of this lovely demonstration, damage and has a history, it becomes more beautiful. Also, when we work in the healing of trauma, we're working with some very primal, primordial, animal impulses and sensations and feelings, and how we tame them, not suppress them, but tame them and learn to ride them like one learns to ride a wild horse. Never in control, but also moving together in this unit task between rider and, and horse. Okay, um, let's look at the roots of traumatization briefly, and I'm going to show you a short video. And um, what I'm going to ask you to do is, as you see this, to let the images impact upon your sounding board, your body sensations, feelings, any images that come up, any thoughts that come up as you're watching this. This is kind of a, an exercise for us to all participate with, whoop, if you choose. What you're going to see... Okay. Ah, yes, it's not, it isn't. Yes, thanks for plugging it in. Okay, so what you're going to see is a typical predator-prey interaction, uh, and it takes place between two of the fastest animals in the animal kingdom, the cheetah 
and the Impala. And this chase takes place at uh, speeds of over 65 miles an hour, 140 kilometers an hour. And the, ch the cheetah and the Impala are able to keep up an almost equal chase. However, the cheetah uh, fatigues more quickly. And so it's got to make this kill. And if it doesn't make the kill in one or six attempts, her cubs will die. And obviously, the cheetah is an endangered species. So having said that, I want you, again, just to let yourself feel into this, the movement, the velocity, the power of this, the animal nature of this. Because we can't, it's a big mistake. I think the biggest mistake in spirituality is to try to separate the spirit world from the animal world. They really have to be held together in, again, one unity of non-duality. She dashes forward. This time, Duma has killed a good-sized female impala. Unfortunately, in the plane, one's own gratification often stimulates another's envy. Duma's catch has been witnessed from start to finish. The spy is Mama Kingua, a spotted hyena. She knows that Duma is completely exhausted by her final sprint. So she just backs off. And yet, things may not finish as we thought they would, for sometimes the weak are capable of cunning tricks. And it's not trickery. This is a profound physiological reaction, again, that we share with all mammals. Okay. All right. <laughs> so. Again, just being curious about your sensations, feelings, images that come to your mind, or thoughts you have about the experience. And I want to look at this in terms of, of energy, in terms of activation, in terms of energy. So I have here one of my favorite toys since I was three years old, <laughs> the slinky. I remember the first time I got a slinky, and they sat at the top of the stairs and went like that. Oh my God, that was it. I was in love. <laughs> and um, okay, so here's here's the uh, the impala uh, grazing on an uplands meadow. I hope you can see this. I guess it doesn't. Yeah, no way to project it. So it's and so it's it's you know it's it's energy. It's relaxed. It's alert. If there's any possible uh, source of threat. It's, it's, it's alert to that, but it's not on edge. Okay, then when the, the, the uh, pursuit begins, the race begins, the energy is wildly expended. And in that moment, when the cheetah takes the impala down, that vast amount of energy is compressed and held in check. However, underneath this is that same energy where the animal was exhibiting as it was escaping. So in other words, the animal was running to escape, it got taken down, and then when the coast was clear, it was off with the same energy, and that energy was mobilized in action, the action of escape. Um, and there was no problem, the animal knew exactly what to do. Now, um, when the when the when the when the impala um, was in this state of immobility, its inner activation was still wildly uh, active. You know, it's 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 a little bit like you think about you have a really nice sports car and you hit the accelerator 
and it takes off, then you notice a policeman over there on the side, so you hit the brake, but you still have your foot on the accelerator. Okay, and so, but, but it's not moving, so the policeman thinks you're just, you know, waiting for the traffic light to change or something. Anyhow, then when you take the foot off the brake just a little bit, the car lurches forward. So that's, in a sense, what you have here, is something like this, where the energy is coiled in weight, and those of you who know things about some of the occult yoga practice, the mystical yoga practices, particularly the kundalini energy, it's really about accessing this coiled energy, which is, resides in the first chakra, and then bringing it through up the spine, but I would say to the rest of the body, to the rest of the organism. But, and here's the trick, with people, when they start to come out of its immobility, which is what the basis of trauma is, when they start to come out of it, the activation is experienced as a surge of energy, often tingling, vibration, uh, hot, cold, and so forth. And what happens is people, when the, when the animal went into this immobility response, it came out in a short period of time when the coast was clear. However, when people start coming out, and this is what I believe keeps people stuck in trauma, when people st begin to come out of trauma, the energy is frightening to them. So what they do is try to suppress it. And in trying to suppress it, it really only increases the inner force of that energy. So really, and I'll give an example in a little bit, in the trick here, in the approach I developed called somatic experiencing is to access this energy one small amount at a time. Titration. One small amount at a time. It vibrates. It comes to rest. One small and it comes, vibrates and comes to rest. And then all of that energy is restored without the potential, the very real potential for overwhelm and re-traumatization. Okay, so fear in the face of helplessness, terror. And this is where, whoops, I'll go back to that. Okay, now, when we're immobilized with fear, that keeps the, the immobility activated, keeps the animal stuck, keeps the human stuck. And this is immobilization with fear. And that's, again, what is, I believe, at the root of trauma. And this is immobilization without fear. Immobilization without fear. Immobilization without fear. Immobilization without fear, with love, with care. Immobilization without fear. Okay, so then we get to this guy <laughs> named Descartes, and I don't want to stone him, but he, of course, became known, and it's probably not strictly exactly true, with the, the very well-known premise, I think, therefore I am, versus I sense, I feel, I perceive, and I reason, Therefore, I am alive and real. And vitalism is about embodiment, is about the living body, the intelligent, self-organizing life that lives within us and that trauma has the potentiality of bringing us to that embodiment. And uh, a contemporary of uh, Descartes, uh, Blaise Pascal, said, the body has its reasons which reason cannot reason. And who wrote in a letter to Descartes, he said, I cannot forgive you for such a total screw-up. Those are my words, but that was basically what he said. Okay, so, the year of 1969, a year of living dangerously. Okay, in the, in the summer uh, of 69, probably not all of you were around at that time, um, the uh, first landing on the moon. 
And uh, as Neil Armstrong and one other person stepped out on the moon's surface, and then they showed the, the image of the Earth rising, it was unbelievable. I mean, it was really a moment that took people's breath away around the world. And I think in a way, <laughs> short-lived, I'm afraid, but it brought humanity together. Anyhow, later that summer, at the end of the summer, I was asked to see a woman named Nancy. And Nancy had been suffering from all kinds of physical symptoms, as he was mentioning, with a considerable pain, things that would now be called fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, irritable bowel, migraines, uh, severe PMS, uh, urinary problems. And she'd been sent from doctor to doctor. And um, finally, out of exasperation, she was referred to my very dear friend, um, Ed Jackson. And he was a psychiatrist, and because she also had severe panic attacks and agoraphobia, and she was, couldn't leave the house, even with her husband, it was an ordeal. Um, so they thought that maybe he could give her some medications, if you can believe it. At that time, there was one antidepressant and one um, anti-anxiety drug, and he tried them both, and it really didn't make much of a difference. So at that time, I had been developing some relaxation techniques. I was actually did a small study of um, people who had high blood pressure, and when I was able to teach them to learn to relax certain muscles in their neck and jaw in a specific sequence, very frequently, and often in about 20 minutes, the blood pressure would normalize, sometimes dropping 30, 30 um, pounds. Uh, um, yeah, thank you. So, uh, so anyhow, he thought that if I could maybe do some of those relaxations, it would at least help her with the anxiety. So, I began to do the real, and then she came in with her husband, and you could see, I mean, she had the classic uh, eye, deer, deer in the headlight eyes, and you could see they were just, her, uh, her husband and, was, and she were but so humiliated having to rely completely on him and him try, being the only way that she could even leave the house. So I started the relaxation sequence, and all of a sudden, and her, her pulse was about 120 beats a minute, 120, 25 beats a minute. And as I started the relaxation, her heart rate started coming down and down, and it um, was just about 75. And you know the first time, those of you who are therapists, you're successful with your first patient, or you think you are, your first client, and you think, God, I know everything, this is so great. Now that I'm out of graduate school, I'm going to change the world. So it was one of those feelings. However, at that moment, boom, it shot wildly up to about 150, 160 beats a minute. So here's a contest. What do you think the stupidest thing anybody could ever say at that time? Calm down, you relax, you must relax. Something like that. Really stupid. But her heart rate started going down, down to 180, 70, 60, 55. And she opened her eyes and just locked on my eyes. And she said, and her face was pale white, her, her thumbnails were blue. And she said, I'm dying. I'm dying. Doctor, don't let me die. Help me. Help me. Don't let me die. Okay, this was, I don't know, a few years ago, 1969. When I tell the story, I do have this moment where my, tight, my chest feels tight as it did then, but that's okay. Of course, I know what to do and let it move through. And um, at that moment, an image appeared to me on the far wall of the consul consulting room, and it was a tiger getting crouching, crouched and ready to spring. 
and without really understanding at that moment the real meaning of that, I commanded to her, I, Nancy, we'll call her, I said, Nancy, there's a, there's a tiger chasing you. Run, climb those rocks and escape. And at first I could see she just, the, the, she was still in the terror, still in the terror. But then her legs started to move as though she were running. They were shaking and trembling, and I could notice her arms making little movements. And we went through a whole time where she would be, uh, her hands would be icy cold, then they would be warm, there'd be shaking and trembling, and then deep, spontaneous breaths, a sequence which I later became to understand in quite detail. And um, she then, at the end, opened her eyes but this time she opened her eyes, not grabbing onto me, but making soft contact. And I said, Nancy, how are you doing? And she said, I'm doing wonderfully. Would you like me to tell you what happened? And I said, yeah. She said, well, when you told me about the tiger and running, I started to run but my legs were like lead. I couldn't move them. But when you enc encouraged me, then they kept running, and I could feel myself climbing the rocks. And when I got to the top, I looked down, and instead of seeing the tiger, I saw myself when I was four years old being held down by the doctors and nurses while a ether mask was put on my face for a tonsil, for a routine, routine tonsillectomy. So for 20 years, she was 24 when I saw her, her body had wanted to escape from that terror, but she was locked in. And using that image, she was able to move out of that shock state and back into her body. And then she also, when I asked her what she was noticing, she said, I feel like I'm being held in warm, tingling, waves. So that certainly was something that was nonlinear, certainly not expected. But it also get, began to really make it clear to me how trauma can be a portal for many different kinds of spiritual, mystical, and other self, capital S, self experiences. I also realized that it was, if not by luck, blind luck maybe, I could have easily re-traumatized her. And I realized then that the idea was important again to just very gently open to one level of energy at a time, one level of activation, coming to rest and another and another. In other words, to titrate and to be able to move into these difficult sensations, the stuck sensations at first, to move into them and then out, to contract and expand. And when people first begin to connect with these sensations, they feel really scary because most people have been out of touch with those sensations, like Nancy, for 20 years. But when you can help the person move into the contraction, and then guide them so they find that every contraction has an expansion. Every contraction, an expansion. Every contraction and a greater expansion. So again, polarities of contraction and expansion. Okay. Now, around this time, uh, I was starting to teach some people Ah, I think actually one of the people who were in one of my first classes is standing right there in the 70s, trying to explain to different therapists what in the world I was doing so it would become teachable. So I would try to get some kinds of images, metaphors, whatever, to help them understand how to track this in clients and how to guide them from trauma to awakening and flow. So here is a stream. Okay, this is a little boat, little tugboat that's going across, uh, along the stream. 
And it has a wide range of where it can go. It can go near one bank to near another bank and go between the two banks fully. So it has full access to the stream, the stream of life. Now, most of us, oh, all of us, have um, challenges, developmental challenges throughout our lives. And this is represented by these, these rocks that are in the stream. And as we move through those developmental challenges, and we're able to do them successfully because we were cared enough for, we were held enough for, we were touched enough for. We, helped our, we were helped to feel stronger sensations of pleasure and joy and laughter. All of these things give us more access to the whole totality of the stream of life. Now, trauma is something different. It's not like an obstacle that we move through. It's really like there's a breach, a rupture in the banks of this stream, a, 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 a rupture that uh, actually Freud, in 1916, I think, he said, I think he gave one really excellent uh, definition of trauma. Of course, he changed that later on with the, you know, the Oedipal complex and inner conflicts and so forth. But uh, sadly, he missed the point in doing that. But he, 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 he defined trauma as a breach, the breach, like you see here, and the protective barrier against stimulation. And I would add against overstimulation, leading to feelings of overwhelming helplessness, which again is really what trauma is. But let's see what happens when we have that, that breach, that that rupture in the container of our inner sensations, our inner experience. Okay, so the boat comes along, and this rupture then becomes a vortex. That's what happens if you, if, if these are both bodies of water, maybe the green is a still body. So it starts to form a, a vortex. And that vortex pulls the person into the trauma. You don't want that, because that's just going to re-traumatize the person. And I'm, um, one of the, the types of uh, therapy approaches for trauma, which I really have issues with, is where the people are made to relive their traumas over and over and over. It doesn't help, because it just makes that vortex even stronger, fits more energy into the trauma itself. Not with all people, but with many people. So, okay, so now the person is either sucked into the trauma, trauma vortex, or they go as far away as they can from the trauma vortex so that they're not pulled in. But now, let's see if I can get this here. I don't know if you, can you see the pointer here? Okay, so what happens is instead of having this whole range of, uh, of sensation and feeling, they avoid and they go as far as they can away from the trauma, but in doing that, they just remain more shut down, more avoidant, which is where the agoraphobia with Nancy was taking her, to doing anything to avoid having any stimulation, because any stimulation then sucks the person into the trauma vortex. All right, so, it doesn't look like there's any solution here, is there? But, okay, so interesting, and you'll, I'll show you some illustrations of this later. Whenever you have one vortex, another vortex will form in the opposite direction. And I call this the counter vortex. And there's a big difference between the two. Well, at first, the trauma vortex is stronger, but the trauma vortex is a vortex that's happening outside of the system, whereas this counter vortex is within the mainstream. And what you're, of course, wanting to help the person is to integrate back into the mainstream. So, then, by helping the client stabilize, and I know these are theoretical and those of you who are at the, at the workshop this afternoon got some idea of how I actually do that with a, a couple of clients who were, or people who were, I demonstrated with. 
So anyhow, they then come to an equal proportion, which is what two vortices will do if you provide the stability that you need. And there it is. So now, when the boat comes, it moves into the counter vortex, and then from the counter vortex moves into the trauma vortex. Let's go back again then. So it moves from the counter vortex into the trauma vortex. And that's actually a good thing. Now, two things, again, we had one where the person just goes into the trauma vortex and they're swallowed up by it. The other is actually they just circulate in this counter vortex. And people in this counter vortex may have kind of all kinds of mystical experiences, but they're disembodied. They're cut off from the person's felt experience. They come as beatific images and so forth. In meditation, this is sometimes called the bliss bypass. And I've been doing some teaching in different meditation centers, and um, again, everybody there could identify with these things, either being sucked into the trauma vortex or just going into the beatific realm. Both of those are polarities. Both of those are, well, they're dualities, okay? So, and here is the trick. So when the person goes from the, tr the trauma vortex, and I don't know if you can exactly see it, we haven't quite got these big enough here, but they pick up some element of the counter vortex, that's this blue person here lying on its side, and it picks up one element from the trauma vortex, one small piece of experience, one small releasing of energy. Right? And, it, and then it t comes back into the mainstream, releasing some of the energy that's locked in, but at the same time, and this is the key, being able to hold those two experiences of contraction and expansion together, to hold them together. So this is, I don't know if you can all see this, but... Uh, this is a little, I just found this actually just when I was leaving Zurich. I thought, oh my God, I didn't know where these were. So I said, perfect, I packed them. So, okay, so here is one element of the counter vortex experience, the expansion experience. Here's one element of the trauma vortex, the extreme contraction element. Yellow is the observing presence through body sensations. And so each time they make a figure eight between the counter vortex and the trauma vortex, these two elements are held together and give the new experience of unity, of warmth, of self-compassion, and many, many other so-called um, uh, spiritual experience, the feeling of now, of e eternal now, of time and space just moving out in all directions. Five, oh, screw it, okay. I gotta move, all right, okay. So anyhow, boom, 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 each time until the two vortices are fully integrated. So, thank you. Ah, okay, so anyhow, uh, I was talking, I was giving a talk, and somebody said, really, you need to talk to this particular lama. He was a Tibetan lama. So, and he was in Berkeley. So when I, I was in Berkeley, I, uh, I uh, uh, called him up and asked if I, could, if I could come over. He said, well, why do, you, why do you want to come over? And I said, well, I talked a little bit. And he said, oh, that's very interesting. Come on over right now. So I asked him, I told, talk, talk, told him about all of this, what I'm really telling you, and he said, and I asked him if he knew of anything like that in Tibetan Buddhism, and he said, well, yes, there's one tradition, it's the Komnai tradition, which is a very body-centered tantric um, practice, and, but he said, actually, this is not something that's just Tibetan, this is a deep knowledge of healing that's come from all different parts of the world. And 
it was probably originated in the, Celt the Stone Age Celtic uh, temples. And I thought, wow, that is really interesting. So, you know, at that time there was no internet, so I went to the library and I found this picture of the Stone Age temple. What's, in order to pass into the inner sanctum, into the inner temple, one had to go through this, over this obelisk, or through this obelisk, and you see the two vortices, all in pairs. Yeah, that is, I thought, whoa, that is really cool. And then when I was working at the Hopi Guidance Center in Second Mesa, Arizona, I met this artist, and this were, these are some of her paintings. And two galaxies spinning in counter directions, storms at the North Pole of Jupiter. And Jung said, once the psyche is a self-regulated system, as an alive body, a regulating counter-reaction develops in the unconscious. Bingo, right on. And, uh, and in meeting different Jungians and talking at different Jungian institutes, I find that, um, you know, not so many, but a number of them are becoming much more body-centered in their work and, and easily relate to what I'm talking about. Now, I'm going to try to just um, do a, whoops, oh, I don't know how much time I have too much, but I want to just talk about my encounter with trauma. Uh, and when I was um, writing uh, in an unspoken voice, whoops, hello, glasses. Okay, all right, I'll try without my glasses. 2.5, that's a lot, but I can, I can live with it. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> I, I'm welcome to your world now. So when I, I was writing this book, I uh, quoted, uh, I, I, I consulted the I Ching, the Chinese Book of Changes, which again is a real incredible book of non-dualistic understanding. And I threw hexagram number 34 for chapter 1. Uh, whoops, no, let's do this one. Uh, hexagram 51. When a man has learned within his heart what fear and trembling mean, he is safeguarded against any terror produced by outside influences. When a man has learned within his heart what fear and trembling mean, he is safeguarded against any terror produced by outside influences. No matter how self-assured we are, in a fraction of a second our lives can be utterly devastated. As in the biblical story of Jonah, the unknowable forces of trauma and loss can swallow us whole, thrusting us deep into their cold, dark belly. Entrapped yet lost, we become hopelessly frozen by terror and helplessness. Early in the year 2005, I walked out of my house into a balmy Southern California morning. The gentle warmth and soft breeze gave a lift to my step. Certainly, this was the kind of winter morning that makes everyone in the rest of the country, possible exception of uh, Garrison Keeler of Lake Wobegon, want to abandon their snow shovels and move to the Southland's warm, sunny beaches. It was the beginning of a perfect kind of day, a day when you feel certain that nothing can go wrong when nothing bad can possibly happen. But it did. I walked along absorbed in happy anticipation of being with my dear friend Butch for the celebration of his birthday. I stepped out into a crosswalk. The next moment, paralyzed and numb, I'm lying on the road, unable to move or breathe. I can't figure out what has just happened. How did I get here? Out of a swirling fog of confusion and disbelief, a crowd of people rushes towards me. They stop aghast. Abruptly, they hover over me in a tightening circle, their eyes staring fixed on my limp and twisted body. From my helpless perspective, they appear like a flock of carnivorous ravens swooping down on an injured prey, me. So, 
Slowly I orient myself to the real threat and I see the grill of a car and a wide-eyed teenager opens the door and just looks totally terrified and aghast and she sees me laying on the ground. Her window shield is cracked and something happened which even for all that I know and guiding people with this for, you know, for 40 years at that time, I don't think I could have done this alone. And thankfully, a woman came up and she said, I'm a doctor, I'm a pediatrician. And I remember thinking in a strange kind of way, because I was actually at that time, I was out of my body looking down at the whole scene. And when she came and asked me if there's anything she could do, I said, please just sit by me. And she took my hand in her hand, body to body, hand, hand to hand. And I went inside and I could feel myself coming back out from this dissociation from the fragmentation coming back into my body in waves of gentle shaking and trembling and then a, a red rage moved through my body and the thought, how could that stupid kid go through the crosswalk? And this went on and when the ambulance finally came, uh, my heart rate, of course, when I was laying on the ground was about 160, which is normal for something like that. And then when I was going in the ambulance, the ambulance driver was taking my vitals, and I, I said, actually, um, could you tell me what, your, what the reading is? And she said, I'm sorry, I only can tell that to the doctors. <laughs> so I, I said, actually, I am a doctor. <laughs> half truth, half truth. Well, di I didn't say what kind. Anyhow, she said, something's wrong, I, let me redo it. And she did that three or four times. And she said, I don't understand it. Your pulse is 74, your blood pressure is 120 over 70. It's not supposed to be like that. So I never miss an opportunity. And so I gave her a talk about <laughs> what, I, what I did. And she said, I think we could use that. So we did set up a program to teach some of the emergency workers to do things so that they can help people come out of the shock, come back into life. Thank you. Thank you.